folks, this is Pastor Mike Hoggard, pastor of Bethel Church in Festus, Missouri, and head of prophetic research ministry with another Watchman video broadcast. We're going to be talking about two kingdoms today, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of, you know, that other guy that we don't want to talk about, the kingdom of Lucifer. Uh, what's going to happen in the future? What is happening right now to bring in what is going to happen in the future? And this was really brought to me, this whole idea was brought to me this week by many emails that people were sending me uh, concerning two men that we're going to deal with today. And I'm going to take a long way for us to get there. The first guy is uh, our old buddy Glenn Beck. The second one is Rick Warren. Now, both of these guys are tied together. Uh, now, obviously, they both work for the same person. Um, Rick Warren's books are all published by Rupert Murdoch and his publishing companies. Incidentally, Rupert Murdoch happens to own Fox News, which uh, where's, is where Glenn Beck has his program on. So they both have the, sort of the same, same route here with Rupert Murdoch, who happens to be a Knights of Malta. Now, if you don't know what that is, uh, the Knights of Malta... It's a, it's a Roman Catholic um, uh, organ, sort of like a secret society. It's sort of like the Roman Catholic Church saying, uh, you're one of our guys, you're helping us, and so we're going to give you this honorary knighthood. And that's who Rupert Murdoch is, and he tells Glenn Beck what to do. And believe it or not, I think he has an influence upon Rick Warren. And we're, we're going to see that both of these guys have sort of the same, the same goal in mind. And it's not... God's kingdom. I can tell you that with a straight face or a round one. It's not God's kingdom that they're interested in. It's a different one. And I hope to educate you today concerning how you can tell the difference. You see, I happen to be on the side of, of God's kingdom. That's where I want to spend eternity. That's who I want to serve is God. There are other people out there that have chosen the other side for one reason or the other. Now, I hope to educate you a little bit just so that you understand what is the difference. And there always is a difference. It's the difference between light and darkness and night and day. So we're going to be talking today about the New Age movement, and there's a lot of people who really have heard the term. Maybe you say you kind of follow the New Age movement a little bit, and you don't really know what it's all about. And so I'm going to educate you a little bit on what exactly the New Age movement stands for, what it's all about, who's promoting it, that'd be Glenn Beck and Rick Warren. You'll, you'll see it at the end. You'll see the biblical reasons why I am saying what I'm saying to you today. So I hope to educate you on what the New Age movement is all about. And I was praying about how to do this this morning. God, uh, you have to give me some insight here. God, give me some revelation. The Holy Spirit just dealt with me and said, Mike... Just give them the truth. And I immediately knew what he was talking about. So I want to start out with scripture today. I want you to read the scripture here. Revelation chapter 21 verse 1. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem. I want you to look at the words new here. New heaven, new earth. Um, New Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. I want you to get this idea because this is really the original intention of God. God always intended to have a new heaven and a new earth, a new Jerusalem that was to be a picture. The whole thing is a picture now of Jesus the bridegroom and the bride of the church. And those two coming together and becoming the body, the new body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This is the plan of the ages. This plan you can trace all the way back to the book of Genesis. In Genesis chapter 2, God looked at the man whom Luke referred to as the Son of God, referring to Adam, the first Adam. And God saw the man and he said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him help meet for him. And so God created the woman, brought him to the man. The two became one flesh. This really is the, is the picture of of what is going to happen in the last days with a new heaven, a new earth, a new Jerusalem. And so we see that the marriage bond between a husband and a wife 
Not between a husband and a husband. Not between a wife and a wife. Not between a husband and some other animal or anything like that. But between a man and a woman. This was the plan of the agents. And so you know that the devil is going to have something that kind of looks like that. But it's going to be its mirror image of what God had intended. But notice that he's talking about everything being made new. In Revelation 21 verse 3 the Bible says, And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, no crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Now I'm going to stop right here, because I'm reading this verse, and I'm, I'm, as I'm reading this verse, and I see the glories of what God has in store for us in the last days, I see the opposite here. Notice that he's saying here, uh, that God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain. I'm telling you that hell is the exact opposite of that. Hell is full of tears. Hell is full of death. In fact, it's the place of death. Hell is full of sorrow. And hell is full of crying. And hell is a place of absolute torture. It is the exact opposite of what God has in store. Notice verse 5. And he said, He that sat upon the throne, that's Jesus Christ, said, Behold... I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. God wanted these words written down because he wanted a record for mankind of what he intended to do, what he wanted to do, what he offers you and I, in that God offers us to make all things in our life new. And I don't know about you, but I'm getting tired of the old stuff. I'm getting tired of the old world, the old flesh, the old sin nature. I get tired of these things, and I want God to make all things new. And I praise Him that He is going to do that one of these days with no crying, no sorrow, no pain, none of that. Think of the opposites now. Think of an opposite kingdom that the devil promises to those that follow Him. And I want you to think about that as we move on. I want you to notice also Revelation chapter 21 verse 10. The Bible says, And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain, and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven, having the glory of God. And her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. In verse 12 he says, And it had a wall great and high, and had twelve gates. And at the gates twelve angels and names written thereon, which are the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. And on the east three gates, and on the north three gates, and on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations. I want you to notice this now, because we're going to be dealing, we're going to be dealing with the foundations here. The wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. So I want you to understand this. That the, the building of this new Jerusalem, this beautiful city that comes down from God out of heaven and bridges the gap between heaven and earth. This city has 12 gates. It has 12 angels. These angels represent the promises and the grace and the gifts of Almighty God. The 12 foundations are what it's based upon. And it's the foundations, it's the foundation, the Bible says, of the 12 apostles, which ultimately is this book that I hold in my hand right here. The very foundation of New Jerusalem is the gospel of Jesus Christ, the grace of God, the love that God has for all of mankind, and the fact that he takes us from being old and makes us completely brand new, eliminating all of our death, all of our pain, all of our sorrow, and everything like that. The twelve apostles, these are the men that wrote the, the books of the Bible, the, the scriptures, the doctrines that we have. Paul writing the, that love chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, that charity chapter. Things like, greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friend. These are the men that wrote words like this. They were the very words of God. They are the foundation, number one, of God's church here on this earth. Number two, they are the foundation, they're the foundation of my life, the foundation of my marriage, the foundation of my family, of my church, of my ministry, of my philosophies, how I think. These are the foundations of them, and they are the foundations 
of what God intends to do at the end of time when he makes all things new. Those are good things. That's the beautiful foundations that God has built, has built, and will build his kingdom on. I want to look at the opposite here for just a little bit. I want us to look at the, the foundation and the inspiration of the new age. They, they promise a, a, new, a, a new paradigm, a new age. It's supposed to be this time when, when man is in this ascended state. He has become a god. Where did these ideas come from? Well, we understand that it's going to be the exact opposite of what we find in the Bible. But there are other foundations for this, for this new age movement, this other kingdom that we're talking about, that I kind of want to share with you today. And then we'll get to uh, Glenn Beck and, and Rick Warren a little bit later. So you, so you understand why I'm saying what I'm saying about these men. What they're doing right now will sh we'll share with you and show you what kingdom they're pointing people to. Uh, New Jerusalem had 12, had 12 angels. So we know the angelic realm. These are the messengers of God. We know something about angels that the Bible tells us. Number one, there are good angels. Michael's a good angel. Uh, Gabriel's a good angel. He's a messenger of God. We know that Jesus is referred to in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord, the strong, the captain of the host. So we know that he's the, the top one of all these, being the son of God and being the only begotten of the Father. We know that. And uh, we know that the 12 foundations, the 12 apostles, the doctrines, the Bible, and so on. Let's look at the New Age movement for a minute and kind of get our bearing straight on, on what, who inspires them and what their foundations are. Uh, this number 12 is interesting because there is a whole area of the New Age movement that has to do with the, const the 12 constellations that are up in the sky and they say that these 12 these these angelic beings or these ascended masters represented by the um, by the zodiac by the by the 12 regions of space that these 12 actually govern the affairs of planet earth and it's these ascended masters these these spirits that are going to come down to the earth one of these days Actually, it's not that gentle because the Bible says in Revelation 12 that the devil and his angels, they don't come down to the earth, they're cast down to the earth. That's one of the principles of the New Age movement is that the ascended masters represented by that number 12 is going to come down to the earth bring mankind into a new age of enlightenment, of inner peace, of harmony amongst all mankind, that the earth that we live on now is absolutely going to become a heaven. It's not going to happen that way. We also look at the foundations. We have, we have the, um, the angelic foundation, the founding of new heaven and new earth. We have the earthly foundation, which is the 12 apostles. So we have the angelic or the spirit realm founding of the new age principles. And we also have their earthly counterparts that lay the foundation for what is going on in the new age movement, what has always gone on in the new age movement, and what will become of the new age movement and those that follow it. Uh, I'm going to bring out some people. We talked about this in our video called The Prophets of the New Order. Um, if you don't have a copy of that, call or write our ministry and we'll get you a copy of that. And, and I'm just going to kind of just give a little bit of information today. I'm not going to go much into it. A little bit of information upon some of these founding members of what we now know as the whole New Age movement at large. Some of these people, including... Helena Blavatsky, Russian born. She was in contact with the ascended masters, with what the Bible refers to as devils. The Bible refers to them as something else, and I'll kind of point that out a little bit later on. She wrote a book called Isis Unveiled. Now let me stop here. Let me kind of explain uh, a little bit about who Isis is. Isis is that, that goddess 
She is known by many names. She is called Isis to the Egyptians. She was Ashtaroth, Ishtar, Easter, Venus, Aphrodite. She has been known by many names. The Bible in the book of Acts refers to, as remember, in Ephesus there was a temple built in her honor. Only to them she was known as Diana. And the book of Acts says that the whole world worships Diana. And so this female goddess concept has been around since time began. We know that every culture and every civilization in the world has had some sort of goddess or some sort of idea of worshiping a female deity. Almost always, this female deity is sort of like a, a fertility sex god. And in some of the ancient temples, you might want to just kind of take a guess at how she was worshipped inside of these temples. Okay, I mean, I'm sure you can probably drum up an image very quickly. Okay, but that's who she was. And so, Blavat, and this Isis unveiled. I mean, it's a huge volume, and she claims to have written it by inspiration that she was told or dictated the words that she wrote in this book. And it's all about unveiling Isis or revealing this spirit to the entire world. Let me show you who this spirit really is. Revelation chapter 17 verse 5, the Bible says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. This is the spirit, the, the Isis, that Blavatsky was going to unveil. And so now we move forward here to the, to the time that we live in now. And we look at the New Age movement. We look at things that are related to it like uh, Wicca and other things that where we can see clearly this goddess spirit, this mysterious, secretive, unveiled, cloaked, hidden spirit, and all of the religions that follow her, the mystery religions, including Roman Catholicism, which, you know, they don't call her Isis, they call her, she's the Virgin Mary. That's who they're worshiping. And when you hear a Roman priest talk, I mean, he's all the time talking about, oh, the mystery of the sacrament, and the mystery of marriage, and the mystery of the, or the Holy Roman Catholic. They're always telling you that everything they do is a mystery. And by the way, don't read and interpret the Bible, because that's really our job. It's a mystery to you. But we have it unveiled to us. That's like the core of mystery religion, secret societies that operate in secret that say, when we tell you our secret, don't tell anybody else. That is the exact opposite of Bible Christianity. And so we can see that spirit in operation today. And Blavatsky sort of wrote the book on her educating people, educating leaders, educating people throughout time Concerning Isis, whose real name, 13 words, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. Blavatsky was part of a group of people that formed what was called the Theosophy Society. Now that's an interesting word there, because Theos means God. And in, in the Greek here, Sophie, or actually according to Blavatsky herself, her name was Sophia. Sophia was this Greek idea of, of ultimate wisdom. Sophia is another name for Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. So we, here we have a, a religion called Theosophia, Theosophy. They're merged together. It's the god and the goddess together, sort of like Horus and Isis, or oh, excuse me, Osiris and Isis coming together. That's what Theosophy is all about. And she developed this, this sort of New Age religion, which has become the foundation of a lot of the things that are going on right now. And she wrote the, made this symbol for Theosophy. I want you to take a look at this. And you know, I, I, I like symbols. I like to look at symbols and I'm going, okay, I got that, I got that. Let, let me just kind of break this down for you here real quickly. We have, um, we have a crown. And a crown denotes a king. Revelation 9-11, and they had a king over them who was the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name was Abaddon and Apollyon, which means 
the destroyer. So the, the, the king of theosophy, hence the originator of what we now know as the New Age movement, is none other than the beast that's down in the pit. Revelation chapter 9 is all about releasing them. And this king emerging to take over planet Earth. Read Revelation chapter 13. Um, we have this thing here. It looks like a swastika. Okay? Here's a swastika here. What's that? Was she a Nazi? No, she came way before the Nazis. This, this swastika is actually, some say it's a good luck symbol. The Indians used it. The other Indians used it. The American Indians used it. It goes all the way back to ancient times. And this swastika was really, it was really, it was called a symbol of life or a symbol of immortality. What it really represents is the X chromosome where your DNA is stored. But I want you to notice that this is not just a simple X. It is an X with opposites in it. You know, pointing in different directions. That is the fusion of opposites, sons of God, daughters of men, the angelic realm mingling together with the earthly realm. Remember what New Jerusalem was about. It was, it was the, the, the heavenly kingdom coming down to the new earth, joining them together. That's what that is, only it's the occulted form of it. We have the triangle pointing up, the triangle pointing down. Everyone says, well, that's the Star of David. Does that mean they were Jews? No, 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 no. It goes way, way, way beyond that. Here again, we see opposites. Sons of God pointing up, daughters of men pointing down, and they are fused together. We have the snake, the Ouroboros. Okay? The snake, think about uh, something in the Bible that has to do with the snake. We have the snake, and his mouth is open, and his tail is inserted into his mouth. And so you read books like uh, Morals and Dogma, you read Manley Hall's uh, The Secret Teachings of All Ages, you read some other things by Blavatsky and others, and you get it. I mean, you understand what this is all about. The tail of the snake, they say the Ouroboros is a symbol of the, the immortality of man. How man's going to become, you know, a god, okay? So the, the Ouroboros, the tail, represents the male. The mouth open represents... The female. That's the core of the New Age movement. That's the foundation and the basis of it. This is what Blavatsky devised. Then, oh, I don't even. Uh, let me cover. I don't even like looking at this guy. This is Aleister Crowley. Aleister Crowley referred to himself as the beast. 666. This guy was, let's see, and, and as a teenage boy, he had had homosexual encounters. This goes back to the 1800s. Teenage boy, homosexual encounters, and he was dreaming, and he was having visitors. Remember Jared Loftner from what we talked about last week? He was having visitors come to him in his dreams, talking to him, giving him enlightenment, illumination. So here he is. He has this funny little, you know, like pyramid hat on his head with the all-seeing eye, you know, draped over his forehead. That's the opening of the pineal gland, the third eye of illumination. Notice his hands. Thumbs pointed in opposite directions. He's telling you the secret doctrine, which is another book that Blavatsky wrote about. Uh, he's telling you the secret doctrine, the secret idea, the fusion together of the opposite, sons of God, daughters of men. Daniel chapter 2, the fourth kingdom, they, sh they that shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. That's what that represents there. And of course, he's got his book that he wrote with this 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, this pentagram on here. That represents Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, number one, I will ascend into heaven. Number two, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. Number three, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. Number four, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. And number five, I will be like the Most High. He's the opposite of everything that God is. And yet people are going to think that Lucifer is God. And that's what Crowley represents. So, is, is this idea of a New Age movement, and they talk about a Christ consciousness. They talk about Jesus being one of the ascended masters. And uh, according to Crowley, that just, 
That bothers me. Crowley, this Christ figure with a crown of thorns, he's not the real Jesus. He's another Jesus. That's who Crowley represents, another Jesus. So here we have Blavatsky, Isis unveiled the secret doctrine, and Crowley representing another Jesus, and, and uh, the kingdom of the Antichrist coming in the last days. These are the foundations now of the New Age movement that you and I see all around us today. By the way, Aleister Crowley got in contact with a uh, uh, what he, some ascended master or, or secret guardian of the ages or whatever you want to call it. And he called him Lamb, L-A-M. And this is what Lamb looks like. I've seen this guy before. You ever seen these TV shows where they have these gray aliens with these big heads? and That's what that is. The whole New Age movement, the whole UFO cult movement, it all comes from the same demonic source. So Crowley was led not by the 12 angels that uh, come down from heaven that uh, are, the, are representations of the gates around Israel, not by the 12 apostles, but by a devil. That's who was the inspiration for Aleister Crowley. Around the time of Crowley and Blavatsky, you had a woman by the name of Elise Bailey. She had drawn from the work of those two, and she went on to do her own things. Elise Bailey wrote several volumes, and most of which, she says, was given to her by inspiration of this beautiful ascended master named Joa Kuhl. She would receive enlightenment. She would, she would channel this entity to give her light and to tell her the secret plans of what's going to happen. According to the Wikipedia article on her, Bailey wrote, at least Bailey wrote, that behind all human evolution, now let's stop right here, evolution has to do with man, let's see, remember the Ouroboros, it's a symbol for man becoming immortal. That's what evolution is. Evolution says, oh, we were all way down here, but now we are ascending upward. That's what evolution is all about. That's why evolution is being taught in all of our schools. That's why evolution has such a stronghold in world culture, and especially American culture today. That's why it's such a deadly, dangerous doctrine to let your kids believe. Because if they can teach them that they came from a lower state to the state we are now, now we're on the verge of being able to go from this state to the next level. That's what evolution is. And, and so this article says, Bailey wrote that behind all human evolution stands a brotherhood of enlightened souls. Lamb. Part of that brotherhood. Brotherhood of enlightened souls like Dwal Kul and Lamb who have guided and aided humanity throughout history. For Bailey, the evolution of humanity was intimately bound up with its relationship to this spiritual hierarchy. She believed that the stimulating and uplifting influences of religions, philosophies, sciences, educational movements, and human culture in general are the result of this relationship. And though in time humanity debases all these developments, they are all in their original impetus conceived as the result of the spiritual hierarchy working in concert with evolving human potentials. Now, Blavatsky, Crowley probably, although I don't have a whole lot of evidence for this, and Elise Bailey, we know for sure, believed that mankind was headed to a, a, a new age, a new kingdom, a kingdom that they refer to, this, and this name was given to her by Joel Cole, the, one, you know, one of, the, one of the ascended masters, one of the enlightened beings that's going to float gently down from the skies one of these days and lead us into a new age. Not, they're going to be cast out of heaven. But she says, Joel Kuhl told her that this, this new age kingdom, the name for it is called Shambhala. And Shambhala is, oh, it's just this beautiful state of being. It's this beautiful nirvana. There's a rock group named that. Uh, this beautiful nirvana, this wonderful, where nobody hates each other anymore and everybody's nice to each other. And get this now, we live in harmony 
with our goddess mother of fertility, Isis, Ishtar, Venus, Diana, Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. That's what, that's what Shambhala really is all about. And they teach you that Shambhala can be reached through seven initiations, like seven rays, seven, uh, you remember the Statue of Liberty? going to be talking about that one of these days, has seven rays coming out of her head. It represents the seven levels of initiation or the seven chakras of kundalini and yoga. Let's see, also the seven sacraments of the Roman Catholic mystery religion. That's out of their own words. Okay, So all this number seven creeps in. What does that have to do with? Revelation 13. Remember this king? Comes up out of the bottomless pit. Guess how many heads he has? Seven. His seven heads. What do they represent? They are the opposite of the seven spirits of God shown to us in Revelation and mentioned in Isaiah chapter 11. Go study it. Chapter 11, uh, I think it's 1 and 2, give you the seven spirits of God. The Antichrist spirits, these uh, seven initiations, these seven rays, these chakras, uh, the, the Masonic ladder, the Masonic ladder has everything to do with the Mithraic initiation. Uh, uh, Albert Pike talks about that. Manley Hall talks about it. And that through these seven steps, or these seven initiations, now I want you to notice this symbol here, the ladder. Remember from all the other things that we've studied, what is this ladder a symbol of? It's a symbol of the bridging the gap between earth and heaven. The ladder is a symbol for man's DNA. Remember, it's encoded into the, the uh, X chromosomes, which is where you get the cross and the swastika and all that stuff. But masonry teaches that by ascending up this ladder of seven rungs that you will achieve Shambhala, Nirvana, whatever you want to call it, this new age kingdom of peace and enlightenment. They're, they're all pointing you... You know, when you hear, like, especially like politicians including George Bush. He should have never said this. But they always say, after all, all roads lead to the same God. Now, as Christians go, no, they don't. No, well, yeah, all except one. All roads, all religions point to the same God except one religion, and that is the religion of this Bible right here that does not deviate from the Word of God. Talking about Bible Christianity. It'll point you to the real God, the real Savior Jesus Christ, the real New Jerusalem. But all of this other stuff will take you to a false God. Elise Bailey wrote several books, like I said a while ago. She uh, was under the influence of a demonic spirit by the name of Joao Kuhl. And she formed a, an organization for educating, for printing books, publications, what have you, to educate the masses concerning the mystery religion. She originally called it the Lucifer Publishing Company. I mean, she's like naming who her leader is, who her God is. They've since changed it now to the Lucis Trust. And the Lucis Trust just happens to be one of those organizations that has its headquarters... Uh, in the United Nations building and associated with the United Nations. Now, there's something interesting that I know about the United Nations other than we ought not be in it, but we are. Um, the United Nations has a, and it's a, it's a religious organization. They say, oh, we're just politics and bringing everybody together. No, it's a religious organization because they have, uh, they have what's called a meditation room. And this meditation room, uh, it, boy, it's, it's just weird. You got, I mean, you see it up there. Um, this weird design in the background that you never really know what it means. Remember, that's the essence of a mystery religion. And then standing before... Now, these, I guess maybe the, uh, the bureau back here would represent the gods. You know, the emblem of worship. And then here you have, uh, you have this big block here. That is a 13, remember the 13 words, the mystery of Babylon, the great the mother of harlots, abomination of the earth. That has, it, it's a 13,000 pound block of iron. 
It represents the iron kingdom that Daniel spoke of in Daniel chapter 2. That fourth kingdom, principalities, powers, rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places, the devils, the, the familiar spirits, the ascended masters, their kingdom. That's who that iron represents. That iron kingdom that will one day mingle themselves with the seed of men. Literally, his DNA. And that's what is the core and the essence of this new age movement. Daniel chapter 2 verse 40, 41. And whereas thou sawest the feet and the toes part of potter's clay and part of iron, the kingdom shall be divided, but there shall be in it the strength of the iron. For as much as thou sawest the iron mixed with miry clay, and as the toes and the feet were part of iron and part of clay, so the kingdom shall be partly strong and partly broken. And whereas thou sawest iron mixed with miry clay, they shall mingle themselves with the seed of men, literally in, embedded into his DNA, but they shall not cleave one to another, even as iron is not mixed with miry clay. Now, Elise Bailey, she revealed in her ingenious plan in her 1957 volume, The Externalization of the Hierarchy, here's what she said, New Age agents would infiltrate the Christian church to modify its message transforming it as an instrument for the universal religion of the 21st century. Here is an article where it quotes her. The goal of the New Age movement has consistently been to bring in the age of Aquarius. I want you to remember that. When all will recognize, here it is, the God within themselves. I want you to remember that statement. I, I want you, to, if you got a piece of paper and a pencil, I want you to write that down. Elise Bailey, who was hearing from a demon, said that we're going to recognize the God within ourselves. I want you to remember that, okay? Uh, recognize the God within themselves. A major step toward this in the words of the New Age prophetess Elise Bailey is, quote, the regeneration of the churches. Stop right here. Regeneration. Genes. DNA. The DNA of the Bible-believing Christian church is this King James Bible right here. That is the DNA. It's represented in other languages, I know that. But here it is right here. The DNA of God's church, the generation, is the Word of God. We need to regene the church, is what she's saying. We need to change the DNA. Have they done that? Yeah, with new Bibles. They've changed the DNA of the church. Therefore, they have regenerated the church. Her branches can serve as a St. John the Baptist, as a voice crying in the wilderness, and as a nucleus through which world illumination may be accomplished. In a word, she desired the time when the, quote, Christian churches would embrace new age concepts of illumination and self Realization. Here's what she said. The mysteries. Talking about the mystery religions, the mystery ideas, the cults. ISIS being unveiled. The mysteries will be restored to outer expression through the medium of the church. Because the Christ, their version of the Christ, is the hierophant of the first and second initiations. He will administer the first initiation in the inner sanctuary of the church. You know what she's saying here? She's saying that when, you know, the, the new age really takes off and gets in full gear, she's saying that it's going to be done because we have successfully in, infiltrated the church. We've taken over. Remember what Lucifer said in his one, two, three, four, five point plan. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. That's the angelic realm. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation. The congregation is a church word. Does the devil want to conquer the church? Man, every day I wake up, there's the devil saying, I think I can get you today. I, I, I think I can do it. He wants to conquer the church. Why? Because the church stands in opposition to what he's doing. We are resistors. And we resist the devil. And he flees from us. And so I want you to get that, get that concept. Okay? We're going to re-gene the church. We're going to make it differently. And then when we begin our plan, it's going to be done through the church. 
We're going to change their doctrines. We're going to change their ideas. We're going to change who they think God is and how you can approach Him. That's what we're going to do. All of these talked about. Now, we, now we're going to skip forward a little bit. We talked about uh, Blavatsky and Bailey. And then we could talk about others. We talked about Crowley. Let's skip forward a little bit. Let's come up to the time now that we're living. You remember uh, in the 60s, okay? Everybody was growing their hair long. Everybody was taking their clothes off. It was the hippie generation, the free love. Drugs were... There was a, a paradigm shift took place in the 60s. I can kind of pin it down to 1963. You have JFK being killed. You have the initiation uh, ceremony of the fallen angel Lucifer in the Vatican, 1963. You have other things. That took, if you go back to 1960s, boy, you can really see that the world just changed all of a sudden. And now, now the New Age movement is, is sort of coming to the surface. People are being educated. People... People are being sucked in. It started out with the hippies. It started out with the, the, uh, the intellectuals in the colleges. It started out with people who really were burnt out on institutionalized Christianity. And they embraced, you know, the occult, astrology, witchcraft, uh, card reading, necromancy. I mean, they were embracing all of these weird things. Crystals and all of this stuff was going on back then. Then you had, there was a group, you remember, the, the, the fifth dimension. One, two, three, four, five singing a song called This is the Dawning of the Age of Aquarius. Now that refers to, here we go, a sign in the zodiac. Remember? The twelve. The twelve, the, the constellations, the stars, the evil angels that now want to bring us into a new age of enlightenment. It goes to the, now to the, uh, we were in the Piscean Age according to them, and now we've shifted now to the Aquarian Age. Aquarius, Aquarius is represented by someone who pours out water. To, to flood or to cover, to bathe everybody in enlightenment, they talk about. But remember, all these symbols can be seen in the Bible. So here we have Aquarius pouring out water. Water, water, water. What is, that a, what is that a picture of in the Bible? Jesus said, Matthew chapter 24, But as the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage, until the day that Noah entered into the ark, and knew not until what? The flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. I think God is trying to send us a message here, letting us know that when we see this... this Aquarian conspiracy taking place. Get ready, because it's just about time. A flood of iniquity is going to be poured out on planet Earth. God's flood of judgment is going to take over planet Earth once again. And it was marked by 1980, a book by a New Ager, Marilyn Ferguson, who wrote the book, The Aquarian Conspiracy. Now, I have a copy of that. And I've read through this book, and I found... Some really, really interesting things here. Marilyn Ferguson was a New Ager. And she was sitting down, and it's quite a lengthy volume. She was sat down and she wrote out exactly, in her opinion, what the New Age was, what it was, what it had done in the past, what it was doing right now, that is in you know the eighties and nineties and so on, what it was going to do in the future. And she said, We have our people everywhere. We have New Agers in one form or another. We have them in just about every realm of life. I'll share with you some of the places that she mentioned that people of a New Age concept and part of the Aquarian conspiracy. You don't believe in conspiracies? You ought to believe in that one. Okay? Because they say it's a conspiracy. And so does the Bible. She said, we have our people everywhere. But I was reading through this book. I, I believe God led me to read this thing. And I started seeing terminology. Phrases that she used back in 19, what, say, 1979, 1980 when she wrote this thing. That I'm seeing, I'm seeing this same terminology in the business realm. I'm seeing it in the realm of politics. But one of the interesting things is, I'm seeing this in the church. Phrases like reformation, 
Synchronicity, great awakening. Rick Warren all is all the time talking about, hey, we're fixing to get into another great awakening here. Um, the video I did on contemplative prayer actually tells you that it's not an awakening. It's being put to slumber. It's where they're going. Okay, The great awakening, tuning in, transformation. How many things in this world are like transfer? We're going to transform this. Trans transformational health care bill. Transform transforming churches. Remember, they said we have to regenerate. We have to regenerate the churches. That's what a transformation is. Community, correct, uh, connectedness, entry point, paradigm shift, synergy, center point or cross point, gu guided imagery, imagination. Remember Jared Loeffner. That's what he was doing by way of this lucid dreaming or this conscious dreaming was guided imagery, imagination, a convergence, and the elevation of man. These are the terms that I was reading that she was saying, these are like our terms, and what, I'm not going to tell you what they really mean. I don't know if she really knew what they meant or not. But she said, these are our terms, and, and pretty soon you're going to start seeing the way we talk. You're going to start hearing a lot of people talk this way, and you may not get it, but we do. We understand. You know, I've mentioned several times about regeneration, the genes, the DNA, the chromosomes, and all this stuff, and we have done countless things in this ministry concerning that because I really think that's one of the key points to remember is the transformation of, da of man is going to be done on the DNA level. So we go back to the Aquarian conspiracy. Here's some things that she said in there. The mysteries we will explore are not remote from us, but ourselves, our brains and bodies, the genetic code. She said that the mysteries of the Aquarian conspiracy had everything to do with man's genetic code, his DNA. Our own biology is the key. She says, homo novus, a new human being. Get on your computer and type in, when you go to Google, whatever search engine you use, and type in homo novus, or type in transhumanism. Because that's exactly what she was talking about. Human metamorphosis. In other words, we're going to come out of our chrysalis and we're going to be transformed to be all these little new age butterflies everywhere. She said the chromosomes are splitting to go forward with a new pattern of life. And so at the core of the whole new age movement, it has everything to do with a kingdom, Shambhala, that you have to go through in steps. By the way, let me, let me deal with this, okay? In Bible Christianity, I believe in a transformation. Be ye not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. How does that take place? How is it that I can go from being a, a little dirtbag human being that's going to die and I'm all rotten and corrupt, how is it that I can go to be... As the Bible says, one of the sons of God. How, how can I do that? Well, the New Age movement, Masonry, the Catholic Church, all of these other groups will tell you that all oh, that has to be done in levels, in steps. You have to do this first, then you have to do this, then you have to do this, and then after that you have to do that. And then you're not done, you have to keep going. Whereas the Bible says... And whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You see, in the, in the false religions like the New Age movement, you achieve this God state by going all these little subtle steps. It's a lot of work. And Bible Christianity says there's one step. And that is simply to call upon the name of the Lord and thou shalt be saved. I, I, I'm telling you, I like God's version better. Because God's version elevates Jesus, not man. The New Age version degrades Jesus and lifts up man. I don't like that. And neither does God and neither does this Bible. So, the chromosomes are splitting to go forward with a new pattern of life. Now, she says, and, and she makes an interesting statement here. And, and I want you to ask yourself, do, do I see like the works of the New Age movement going on anywhere? Do I see it in film? Yeah. Uh, do I, can I see it in politics? 
Yeah. Can I see it uh, in uh, philosophical movements? Is it in the universities? Yeah. If I see strange things happening in my church that I never really saw before, and I'm going, I don't know what this is, but it you know, just doesn't feel right. Well, I don't, I've had, I don't know how many people contact our ministry over the years. Pastor Mike, we're in a church, and I've been there for years, and I love the Lord, and I love the Bible, and, and all of a sudden, we, we, we got us a new pastor, and he's wanting to change everything, and, and I can't really put my finger on it, but it's just something not right about it. And I always tell him, oh yeah, let me, let me tell you where he's going now. And I'll always tell him the steps, you know, the latter steps that these new pastors are making in these churches to transform and re-gene these churches. And they always call me back and say, you know what, you were right. You, had, you nailed it. They did exactly this. And, and so now we don't have any place to go anymore. Pastor Mike, will you, can, you know, can we just be your Bethel church and will you be our pastor? And I'm honored. I am, I am humbled by that, and I praise the Lord for it, but that's what's going on. So, so Marilyn Ferguson, she's, she made this very, very revealing, interesting statement in her book. She said, when you understand the basic change taking place in any one major area, it is easier to make sense of the others. So I'm educating you a little bit about the New Age movement and what it, what it involves and, and how it works and who's behind it and who are these spirit guides and wh what exactly they... I'm educating you so when you see it like in a movie or when you see it in politics, you understand it. But then when you see it I in your church, you go, I know what this is. And I think that I'm going to follow Jesus outside the camp. Praise the Lord for you if you're bold enough to do something like that. Then she names the agents of the conspiracy. Doctors! I want you to remember that. We're going to look at some of these doctors. New age doctors. By the way, if you want to go to a chiropractor, go to a chiropractor. I don't go to chiropractors. If you want to go to a chiropractor, go to If your chiropractor has like a yin-yang symbol on his sign with a, like a snake on it, find another chiropractor. He's a new ager. He has new age concepts and new age beliefs. Don't go for... Uh, let me say this. I say this to some of our watchers out of nothing but pure love. I love you. I do. I, I care about you. I don't, I don't want to hurt you. Some of the people that follow our ministry, I, they're some of the greatest people I've ever heard from in my life. Um, you can kind of look at me and see that I'm not really much into health food. Okay? I don't eat wheat germ, I don't eat bran, uh, I don't, um, you know, some of these natural, I'm not necessarily against them, I mean, I'm not. I mean, I think God gave us good things on this planet to keep us going so long, as long as this corruption of sinfulness will last. Okay, it doesn't last very long, okay? No man lives forever just eating the right combination of stuff that God put on this planet. You need to remember that. We are appointed to death in these bodies. Can we improve that life by the things we do? Absolutely. Okay? But I'm telling you, politics have been hijacked by the New Age. Are you with me? The movie industry has been hijacked by the New Age and the occult. Okay, that's easy. Businesses have been hijacked by the new... These businesses are putting on uh, these seminars all over the place where they send their leaders out. They call them leadership forms. Really, they're just new age principles packaged up as leadership. That's all they are. So is it hard for us to understand that maybe the whole health and nutrition movement in this country, including probably the people that you buy products from, have been hijacked by the new age... I'm going to show you some things. I, I, I want to I be a friend to you, not an enemy. But I'm going to expose some things and I'm going to show you the truth of what's going on. Do I have all the answers on health and wellness? No, I mean, I, I really don't. But I know that God will lead us through the pages of His Word. But I think some people out there believe some things that they don't really have any biblical evidence on. And it makes me suspicious of where it was that you heard some of these things. So we have doctors. Educators. Are there teachers in the elementary school that are new agers? <laughs> oh my goodness, yes. L legislators. 
New Age legislators. Okay? I'm just... And if, they, if, if they're congressmen, if they are judges, if they are politicians, and they're New Agers, that means that they get their inspiration on what to do with our country. Not, not from the Bible. They get it from Dwa Kul and Lamb and the Maitreya and the Christ, the Master Christ. And, but they're not getting it from God. Economists. Captains of industry, foundation officials. You know what a foundation official is? A uh, foundation is a, uh, it's an organization, a philanthropic organization that has a ton of money. George Soros comes to mind, okay? The guy that's funded, the guy that bought the White House, okay? He is a foundation official. In other words, he's got all this money. He's got, the Rockefellers do it. I mean, we know all these people are funneling massive amounts of money into creating a new age, new world. We know that. University programmers, artists, that's easy. Musicians, publishers, te television producers. Rupert Murdoch. And maverick theologians and members of the clergy as they ponder the new spirituality. Okay? These are the people that Marilyn Ferguson, who is, who is a New Ager, said, I'm just letting you know that, you know, our people, you know, being controlled by these devils, they're everywhere. We even have them inside. The Maverick theologians would be the, the guys that would be in, uh, in the Bible colleges. The clergymen, these are the guys, or women, standing behind the pulpits. Okay? Teaching the flock. This is what you need to believe. So, let's get to Glenn Beck, and then we'll get to Rick Warren. Glenn Beck uh, is coming out with a new book. Um, he has a co-author by the name of, uh, oh, uh, he's, he's, he's a med medical doctor, okay? So here we have, we have a doctor, and we have a, a TV host, an artist, okay? And they write a book called The Seven Wonders That Will Change Your, Change Your Life. Seven, the seven chakras to reach Shambhala, the seven rays and initiations to bring you to Nirvana, the seven sacraments in the Catholic Church that if you perform them, then you will be a god. That's, that's kind of what they teach. Remember, multiple steps or whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. I'm teaching you how to identify the right doctrine, excuse me, the right doctrine versus the wrong one. And this is just the surface here. Didn't ever judge a book by its cover? Well, we're starting with the cover. The seven wonders that will change your life. Now, the seven wonders, this title was based upon what the writers like uh, Manley Hall and Albert Pike, and, who wrote Morals and Dogma of Masonry, talked about the seven wonders. Uh, you have the, the pyramid. Okay, you know, with the all-seeing eye. Okay, it's an occult symbol. It represents the new age or the new world order. Um, you have the Colossus of Rhodes, one of the seven wonders, who's holding the torch of, he's holding the torch of Lucifer in his hand. Okay, um, you have the, uh, the Temple of Zeus. Remember the Lincoln Memorial was modeled after the Temple of Zeus. You have the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus. That's kind of hard to say. You have the Mausoleum of Halicarnassus, the mausoleum that he built that represented the fusion of heaven and earth together. This Mausoleum of Halicarnassus basically is the same, it was the model for the Masonic House of the Lodge Temple in Washington, D.C. So Pike and Manley Hall wrote about these seven wonders and talked about their influence and talked about what they were. And he said basically encoded in these seven wonders the fact that they were seven. Seven heads of the beast. The spirits of Antichrist that is operating in the world right now. And that's where, that's where Glenn Beck got the inspiration for this title. Okay, so we judged a book by its cover. 
doesn't look all that great right now, but let's kind of get into it. There was an article written by Brandon House from Worldview Times, and I'll tell you what, he's the guy that broke this story. I don't know much about this guy, but if he watches this, God bless you and thank you for exposing this for what it really is, because we dealt with this back in August of last year. The evangelical community in this country, the Tea Party people and all these people, they are absolutely head over heels in love with Glenn Beck. They think, oh, he's, a, he's so amazing. Oh, he's, a, he's just, he's wanting to be a good Christian and lead the country into, into a, 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 new, a, a new era, a new age. Brandon House wrote this article, and he, I encourage you to read, just Google this, Worldview Times and Glenn Beck and Brandon House. But I'm going to show you a few things here from this article that he points out about Glenn Beck's book. It's a New Age Digest is what it is. Here's what he said. A friend of mine uh, even emailed a mega pastor that was publicly supporting Glenn Beck's 828 rally to ask him to be careful about embracing Beck and his black robe regiment because of some of the false theology Glenn was espousing. The pastor replied, Glenn Beck is a new brother and he's learning and growing and coming to the light day by day as he is being discipled by uh, the name of the Christian leader removed. There was once a day when you and I were in the same place he is now. Be careful that you don't place a yoke on a little lamb rather than an ox. Would this pastor say Oprah Winfrey is a Christian? According to Christian Post, another mega church pastor said, I have interviewed persons who have talked specifically with Glenn about his personal salvation, persons extremely well known in Christianity, and they have affirmed using language evangelicals understand Glenn is saved. He understands receiving Christ as Savior. Now, remember, all the evangelicals and all the people, oh, Glenn Beck, oh, man, don't touch Glenn Beck. Oh, Glenn Beck's going to save America. Glenn Beck's going to do this. And Glenn Beck is just, you know, he's a Christian. Now, he's got a few things differently, but really, we all differ. And so why don't we all just get along and bring in a, a new era, a new age? He's being, he's being followed. The foundation, I'm going to show you this, the foundational beliefs of what Glenn Beck wrote inside this book comes from Blavatsky, Crowley, Elise Bailey, countless others. The source of their doctrine is hell itself. Here's what he said. On page 79, Beck and Dr. Abloh promote a transcendental meditation and Eastern mysticism. On, 80, on page 85, we read, As you commit to unlocking and bringing forth the truth inside you, don't be afraid to pray for help. Don't be reluctant to sit with yourself in silence and meditate. Connect with the miracle of the Spirit of God that has lived inside you from long before you were born. Now, I'm going to stop right here because this statement is what we now call Gnosticism. Gnosticism teaches that, well, every human has a spark of God inside of them. Now, I'm going to show you some more quotes from Beck and from this book. You need, to, you need to get this. He believes in the spark of divinity of Gnosticism, the God that lives inside of you. He said, I questioned everything I could think to question about the faith. He's talking about his Mormon theology. I went over my doubts again and again with the church bishop. I read everything there was to read on their website and every word of Mormon doctrine. I went to anti-Mormon literature for hints, but I found most of it to be unfair or just plain wrong. I tried every trick I could think of to find a contradiction. The problem was that I couldn't. Mormonism seemed to explain the world and my place in it better than any other faith I had looked up. You need to remember that Mormonism is the cult that teaches that the male and the female come together and when they do, they become gods. They're brought to a new age, a new era, and a new level. He says, Latter-day Saints do not believe that your chances ever cease, even with death. They end, he's talking about your chance to accept God. The Bible says, as it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this, the judgment. Now, the Mormons, some Jehovah's Witnesses probably believe this too, I think, believe, and, um, and some of the other groups, they believe that even when you die, you're going to stand before God, and God says, okay, I'm giving you one more chance now. Okay, do you, do you really want to, you know, 
Okay? That's what he's saying here. Latter-day Saints do not believe that your chances ever cease, even with death. They end only with the full understanding and denial of truth by your own exercise of real free will. And even then, there is no lake of fire. Now, we're not talking about something that he said, you know, like 25 years ago when he was an alcoholic. We're talking about something that he's coming out with now. As Keith likes to say, there's no original sin left in the world. Everyone's just recycling pain now. He says, there is no infant delivered evil out of the womb. There never has been, not even one. Charles Manson was not born evil. Ted Bundy wasn't. The BTK killer wasn't. Hitler wasn't. The Bible says we're all born into sin. We're all born evil. We need to be saved. He has this... This new age idea that everybody really is good. It's just that they've had bad people in their life. And so if we got, if we got, rid, if we got rid of all the bad people in the world, then everybody would stay good. It's a dangerous doctrine. He said, the third chapter of Exodus helped me to start to understand how crucial it was that my focus be on finding God, not just in the seas or the cosmos... But in myself, if God is everything and everywhere and inside everyone, then I figured he had to be inside me too. House, Brandon House says this is the promotion of pantheism and panentheism. Divine power is still inside of you. These are quotes from Beck's book. Reach out to people to study them and enrich them and reflect back to them the light that comes from God inside them. You won't doubt your ability to achieve what you want to achieve in this life because you won't doubt that God is not only by your side, but inside you. Now, here's, I want you to look at this quote now. You, you need to see this one. You have a pole star inside of you. Stop right here. A pole star. The northern star. He's referring to Polaris, a star that sits in the northern sky. It stays stationary in the world, you know, and, but it's there and it doesn't move. And around the pole star is a constellation called Draco. It, it's in the sides of the north. That's what it is. The pole star. You have a pole star inside of you. It is connected with all the energy in the universe. Mm. When you begin to follow that, that star, stop, stop. Remember, the, the foundation of the New Age movement were these, these constellations, these stars, astrology that were guiding the steps of mankind, the hierarchy that Bailey referred to that's bringing us all into a new age. He says, he says, you follow that star, you align yourself with immeasurable, inexplicable forces that will actually help you manifest your best intentions. The current energy that flows in your favor when you stop denying what you have lived through and how it has shaped you and how you must change is the immeasurable force that you can tap into to dramatically improve your existence. This sounds like Star Wars. You will elicit the same positive energy from others. When you stop pretending to be just fine and start admitting that you have struggled just as we all have, then spiritual energy will fill you. That sounds like, you know, I, I have a copy right here. That sounds like everything that Marilyn Ferguson said in the Inquirian Conspiracy. The stars will guide us. The spiritual forces will lead us. Elise Bailey, the hierarchy has been pushing us along all this time. These are devils. These are demons. And Glenn Beck is leading evangelical Christians and Tea Party people and whoever, because he works for Rupert Murdoch, who, you know, is sanctioned by the Catholic Church. He's leading people to accept the wrong kingdom and the wrong God. He is new age to the core, 
Mormonism and the New Age movement, they, they don't have a problem with each other. Because they, they all say, you know, we, you know really, we say the same things. We all, we all believe in the same God. That's what they are. So that's, that's Glenn Beck. Then we have Rick Warren. Now, some might say, well, you know, Rick Warren, you know, I used to like him. He's kind of gotten bad. Or, you know, he's, he's, you know, he started out good. Did he? Did he? See, Rick Warren and a guy named Leonard Sweet, you, you need to get this guy, they teamed up a long time ago, okay, back in the young days. They worked on a thing uh, called the Tides of Change, writing, oh, I like this, writing the next wave, okay, the Aquarian wave, writing the next wave in ministry. Uh, this was at one time, maybe still is, I don't know, currently uh, on Rick Warren's Ministry Toolbox website are dozens of quotations, endorsements, and current affiliations with Leonard Sweet and others. Leonard Sweet is guy, I mean, he's showing up at all the new emergent church conferences and he's leading the way. Leonard Sweet wrote a book called Quantum Spirituality. Here are some things that Leonard Sweet said in Quantum Spirituality. He said, Mysticism, once cast to the sidelines of the Christian tradition, is now situated in postmodernist culture near the center. In the words of one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century, Jesuit, <laughs> Jesuit philosopher, stop right here, remember... Remember, Rick Warren works for Rupert Murdoch, who is a Knight of Malta, part of the Roman Catholic Church. Leonard Sweet, Jesuit theologian. There is no such thing as a good Jesuit theologian. Okay. Anyway, in the words of one of the greatest theologians of the 20th century, Jesuit philosopher of religion, dogmatist Karl Rahner, the Christian of tomorrow will be a mystic. You know what that means? He will believe in the mystery religions. He will be part of ISIS Unveiled Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. And oh, by the way, mysticism has everything to do with, instead of praying to God, you channel God. You intuit God. On the, because God is not up in heaven. He's inside of you. Um, the Christian of tomorrow will be a mystic. One who has experienced something, he, or he will be nothing. Mysticism is metaphysics arrived at through mind-body experiences. Mysticism begins in experience. It ends in theology. That is New Age doctrine to the core. He says the first of these five untheorized observations is that new light. That's the New Age term. New light embodiment, by the way, that's Lucifer, means to be, quote, in connection and Information. Remember what Marilyn Ferguson wrote? With other Christians, deeper feeling and higher relating go together. The church is fundamentally one being, one person, one communion, whose cells, hmm, DNA, are connected to one another within the information network called the Christ consciousness. That's the New Age term for this whole Shambhala thing that everybody's going to awake to one of these days. He says, energy fire takes us into ourselves only that we might reach outside of ourselves. Metanoia is a decentering experience of connectedness and community. It is not an exercise in reciting what Jesus has done for me lately. Energy fire ecstasy, more a buzz than a binge, takes us out of ourselves literally. That's the meaning of the word ecstatic. Note, this ecstasy sweet speaks of refers to the new age ecstasy that occurs in an altered state of consciousness. Sweet goes on to say, a surprisingly central feature of all the world's religions is the language of light in communicating the divine and symbolizing the union of the human with the divine. Muhammad's light-filled cave, Moses' burning bush, Paul's blinding light, Fox's inner light, Krishna's Lord of light, Baum's light-filled cobbler shop, Plotinus' fire experiences, Bodhisattvas with the flow of Kundalini's fire erupting from their fontanelles, and so on. He mentioned the symbolizing of the union with the divine, of the human with the divine. That is what masonry is about, the New Age movement is about. The sons of God mingling with the daughters of men. They, the Iron Kingdom, shall mingle themselves with the seed of men. That's what the union of the human and the divine is. The flow of Kundalini's fire. Kundalini teaches that you have, you have a God inside of you. He's there. You just don't know it. And you need to do, you need to do like seven things to the seven chakras of Kundalini. You need to bring this God out. So you can live in a wonderful state of ecstasy and Shambhala and New Age peace. 
So Rick Warren started out hooking up with guys like Leonard Sweet and others, New Agers to the core. People that were hearing from, not the Bible, but people that were hearing from devils, from familiar spirits. See, when you go into this trance and you meditate, that's who you're listening to. You're listening to familiar spirits, devils. That's who you're listening to. I don't know how many people sent me an email on this. Pastor Mike, you have got to take a look at this. And I did. And we're going to deal with it. Rick Warren is a false prophet. Those who have followed the purpose-driven life, the purpose-driven church, the 40 days of purpose, and all the vomit and the garbage that flow out of Saddleback Community Church and, and others around the country and around the world need to stop following this guy. He's got a curse on him. There's something wrong with him. Just recently, he comes out with a new plan. He says in his website, I can't tell you how excited I am about the decade of destiny and what's coming up at Saddleback. Next weekend, we're launching the Daniel plan. Comes out of the book of Daniel, okay? The Daniel plan, a 52-week plan to help you become physically healthier. Some of the details are below, but watch the videos to find out more. So I, I looked at, you know, one of the videos. And, and here to help him with his Daniel plan to help you feel better are three doctors. Now remember, Marilyn Ferguson said that we have New Agers that are doctors. Is, is that these doctors here? We'll find out. Uh, Dr. Amen, Dr. Hyman, and you've probably heard of Dr. Oz, okay? Um, I looked at this, and he's, he calls it God's prescription for your health. Now, he's not just saying, now, this is just like generic principles, you know, that'll help you be fit, and, you know, and you know so, so that you won't sweat a lot and breathe heavy when you walk upstairs. He actually says that this is God's prescription for it. So he's saying that if you worship God... Do it this way. That's what he's saying. Okay? And in this, uh, in this video, you know, it says get healthy. And, and uh, you know, there's a picture of an apple there. Now, you might say, well, you know, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. Uh, maybe. But I, I do know that the New Age movement uses the apple as a symbol uh, quite a bit. Now, the Bible doesn't say that it was an apple that Eve ate from. But the New Agers do. They say that it was an apple. They say that it was the apple of illumination. So we have, we have a company. By the way, Steve Jobs is a New Ager. Always has been. So he forms a company called Apple Com Computers. And his logo is an is a, is a apple with a bite out of it. And he says, think different. Because you need to be regenerated okay uh, the, the word Avalon you know what that means Avalon itself was the, the the bridge to the underworld okay the, the underworld is where all the gods were and if you want to c connect with them you had to go to Avalon okay Avalon is the old word for for Apple the Christian group called Avalon. I, I never got that. Why, why did they name themselves after the, the bridge to hell? I, I just... Uh, it, anyway, they've moved in. Okay? I often wondered a lot, uh, wh why does the New Age movement use an apple for their symbol? And then it came to me. There's a pentagram on the inside of it. Lucifer's five-point plan. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. That has his symbol in it. Now, if you want to look at the reverse of it, God created the apple. He put that five in there to show us grace. Five is the number for grace. And Israel is the apple of God's eye. He's going to have grace on them one of these days. So he mentions a doctor by the name of Dr. Daniel G. Amen. Okay, sounds spiritual, doesn't it? Dr. Daniel G. Amen, medical doctor, a new ager. Magnificent mind with medical hypnosis. He talks a lot about the brain and behavior. Medical hypnosis is 
I'm going to go into a trance, and when I get into a trance, I'm going to empty my mind, and I'm going to be healed from the inside out, because I'm going to get in touch with the God on the inside of me. That's what medical hypnosis is all about. The brain and behavior, according to their website, uh, discusses the value of spirituality, meditation, and prayer from a neurobiological perspective. So really, what Dr. Amen really is good for is teaching everybody how to meditate. How to empty their mind, go into a trance, go down and, and, and remember, go get this video from us called The Mystery of Contemplative Prayer and you'll understand it. But really all this Dr. Amen is good for is teaching everybody how to meditate. How to get in touch with the spirits. These false gods. Okay? Then we have Dr. Mark Hyman. Here was an article. I think it was, it's been featured on several websites. Uh, but I think its source was Lighthouse Trails Research. Uh, they have a lot of good research there. Anyway, the article says Dr. Mark Hyman, one of the three doctors who designed the Daniel Challenge for Saddleback, is another strange advocate for mystical meditation. In his book, The Ultra Mind Solution, Hyman emphasizes meditation saying that it doesn't matter what religion one has to benefit from it. So in other words, he can say, you know, you could be a dirt worshiper, but as long as you meditate, you'll get good stuff from it. Okay, all roads lead to the same God. Uh, Dr. Hyman suggests that mindful meditation is a powerful, well-researched tool developed by Buddhists. On the front cover of the Ultra Mind Solution sits an endorsement by Dr. Mehmet Oz, the third doctor who will be training Saddleback on health. Now here is a book written by Dr. Daniel Amen called Create More Passion Tonight. Everywhere we go to look for the new age movement in something, you will see sexuality involved. It is all over the church. So here, now remember, Rick Warren, these are the three guys that he chose to lead everybody. Okay? Daniel Hyman co-authored a book with a guy by the name of T.J. Bartell called Create More Passion Tonight. I went to T.J. Bartell's website. This guy, this, this guy is filthy. He is absolutely filthy. This website where Bartell talks about what's called tantric sex. Really, remember that Gnostic idea? And we learned this from the Da Vinci Code and from other things. Gnosticism says there's a divine, there's a spark of divinity inside you and it needs something to bring it out to full-blown godhood. Dan Brown taught in the Da Vinci Code that the ritual that brings the divine spark to full-blown godhood inside somebody was tantric sex. In other words, a spiritually based ritualistic sexual encounter the mating of the sons of God and the daughters of men you're acting that out in Wicca it's called the great rite ritual the joining together of the blade and the chalice that's what the airplane flying into the pentagram on 9-11 was all about and and so and so a who is it amen amen writes a book with Bartel Bartel is this fierce proponent of ritualistic orgiistic sex to bring enlightenment to people and so here's what amen said in my book the brain and love I wrote about tantric sexual practices and was fascinated by the concept I wanted to experience it for myself and thought it would be a wonderful way to enhance my relationship with my wife T.J. Bartell became our teacher. I felt as if I had to share his knowledge with everyone I knew. So he's on a mission. He's a missionary. He's an evangelist. To do what? To educate everybody on his experiences in tantric sex. Coming to realization that he was a god by this wicked mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. So we have Dr. Amen, we have Dr. Hyman, and now we have the guy that everybody knows and loves, Dr. Oz. He just looks so cute in those uh, surgical scrubs that he wears on the show all the time. And Oprah has made him rich and famous. 
If you remember, we dealt with him several, several months ago because he was promoting a new age practice called Reiki. For healing, you know, it's to heal people. Reiki, you remember that? Reiki Maxers to cross America and the world had cause for celebration on January 6th when Dr. Oz revealed his ultimate alternative medicine secrets for 2010 during his nationally broadcast afternoon talk show. He ranked Reiki as number one. Dr. Oz said, Reiki is one of my favorites. We've been using it for years in the Oz family and we swear by it. Reiki has everything to do with how you have this healing power in your hands. Let's see, do we know some televangelists that believe that? Okay, But you have the, the power of the gods in your, in your hand, that's a symbol for the number five, in your hand, and, when, and when, you, when you lay your hands on somebody, in fact, here is the Wikipedia article on Reiki, and it talks about the definition of the word Reiki, the English word Reiki meaning an alternative healing method derives from the Japanese word mysterious atmosphere or feeling, which derives from the Chinese word spiritual atmosphere. So already this idea of Reiki we know involves spiritual awakening or a, the spirits being involved. It later says the spiritual life force or vital spiritual energy said to reside in all living things called the chi. In other words, they believe that humans have this energy inside of them, this life energy that needs to be released so that you can have this healing flow in you. I, I have heard this in charismatic circles I've heard that I have heard this from some of the people who follow all the health food stuff and all the health they said if you eat this or you'll do this then you'll release the healing energies that are inside of your body I don't know of any place in the Bible where it mentions that my body has healing energies that need to release it's need to be released it's not there that idea derives from from the spirits, the devils. That healing energy is this king of the bottomless pit that Blavatsky talked about that needs to be released to rule over planet earth. That's what the new age is really all about. And Reiki involves taking your hands and placing them upon the chakra points, the seven chakra points Kundalini, Blavatsky wrote about it, Bailey wrote about it, everything, so that you can release that serpent at the base of your spine and be brought into a new age of enlightenment. I wonder how many church people have gone and had this done, have been a practitioner of this, because they saw Dr. Oz on TV do it, and, and now, now Rick Warren is telling everybody Oh yeah, this this is going to help us. This is this is all part of the gospel. This is this is God wanting us to do this. I said a minute ago. I said a minute ago. My heart is so heavy, and I don't say this term lightly. Rick Warren is a wolf in sheep's clothing, and God has cut him off. Why? I'm going to show you the scriptures. Regard not them that have familiar spirits. Now, he said, God said, anybody in your camp, anybody that you know that is in contact with devils, familiar spirits, okay, ascended masters, spirit guides, Dwa Kul, Jesus Christ, whatever, don't regard them. Rick Warren says to the guys that are full of familiar spirits, come, and I don't want you to educate not only Saddleback, but everybody that I have influence on in the entire world. That's a lot of people. Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 20 verse 6, And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits, and after wizards to go a-whoring. Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots. To go a whoring after them, this is what God said. I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. 
That's what God said. Who are you going to follow? You don't follow Glenn Beck because you like his politics. You think he's going to help America. You're going to follow Rick Warren. Or are you going to come out of the camp where, where Jesus is and say, you know what? I don't want God to cut me off. I'm out of here. What a world we live in, people. What a world we live in. Study your Bible. Let the Bible tell you about health, well-being, not the websites, not the Ray K. Masters, not the TV shows. And definitely don't listen to Glenn Beck and don't listen to Rick Warren and others like them. This is why I stand where I stand. I stand with this Bible. <laughs> this Bible. I stand with this Bible and no other. You should too. This is Pastor Mike. I really love you. I want you to know the truth. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.